It is just a huge honor for me to bring back for a second time Jason Patrick Wood, Esquire. Thank you, sir. The legend from Dentaltown. He is the number one attorney in dental transitions nationwide, has represented over 7,000 dentists. Um, with the law firm Wood and Delgado, has been specializing in representing dentists for over 35 years in such diverse areas as dental practice purchase agreements, dental partnership agreements, dental MSOs, dental space sharing agreements, dental corporations and LLCs, real estate, employment law, dental board defense, estate planning, and other business transactions which a dentist will face during his or her career. He has authored many articles relative to the business side of dentistry, which have appeared in every major public dental publication. His CE podcast pertaining to the business side of dentistry are some of the most viewed dental podcasts in the country. Anybody who does a podcast, if they do Jason, that's usually their most viewed podcast. He is a moderator for Dentaltown on all forums related to the business side of dentistry, has over 7,000 posts on Dentaltown, helping and educating doctors throughout the United States. Prior to joining Woods and Delgado, Mr. Woods worked in Washington, D.C. for the Speaker of the House in connection with the President and the U.S. Congressional Campaigns. Um, thereafter, he worked for the U.S. House of Representatives, drafting legislation for various House committees. His law firm, Wooden Delgado, is in Mission Viejo, California, but he lives in Idaho because he's Irish and he wanted to be close to those potatoes. There you go. And uh, serves clients nationally. Uh, he went to law school at the University of San Diego Law School, um, but left when the Chargers left. Uh, you, uh, uh, so do you know how many potatoes it takes to kill an Irishman? No. None. None. Because God. They starved to death. There you go. <laughs> wow. Ah, that was a brutal Irish joke. <laughs> uh, so seriously, though, you were in San Diego Law School. Um, yep. Did San Diego take the Chargers leaving? Did they take that very easily? Or? Uh, you know, th they can't come back, that's for sure. Um, oh, really? It's yeah. It's that, a, never dated an ex-lover. <laughs> exactly. I mean, the San, San Diegans despise that family now. Really? Like, well, I mean... San Diego, believe it or not, I mean, it, it is, it, it's one of the biggest cities in the nation, but it feels like a small town. You have so many little enclaves and it's, it's a wonderful feeling, but now granted you're in California, so everybody's a fair weather fan, but San Diego prided themselves on the Chargers, secondarily the Padres, but um, you know, when, when you feel like you're the redheaded stepchild, you know, for LA and you go, that's it, we're done. You are done. So Well, I live in Phoenix, and I'm pretty sure that 12 out of every three people in Phoenix wants to live in San Diego. <laughs> I, I can uh, imagine they, that. They just can't afford it. Uh, and you, you go to San Diego, and, I, and <clears throat> sometimes you, you get duped in, and you're like, oh, look at that little house. And you can see the ocean. It's for some. It's so cute, and it's yeah. so charming. And then you walk in and see how much money they want for it. And you're like, are Two you mil. out of yeah. your mind? Yep, exactly. Um. So, you know, uh, a quarter of my viewers, when they send me an email, Howard at Dentaltown.com, they're still in dental kindergarten. Right. And the other ones, I mean, I almost never get any emails if they're uh, over 30. So if you if you did reach the big three, what would they have to be born in? Uh, 1990? If you yeah. were born before 1990, send me an email, Howard at Dentaltown.com, <laughs> just so I know uh, one, one guy out there exists. Um, but they're, they're just trying to get through dental school. They're trying to do their requirements or right. trying to get through all this stuff like that. Um, I don't even think they've started to, um, realize, um, their, their legal needs in the futures. And, and I want to hit them off quickly because I've written many articles about stay in your own lane. It's like, right. when I see the dentist do the damnedest, dumbest things, I'll say, well, you, you signed a 10 year lease. I said, right. who was your real estate attorney? Oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. I learned it in all in anatomy, physiology, now. I mean, yep. when we were learning about uh, eukaryotes and prokaryotes, they threw in some business law, and so I just, I just want to head you guys off the very young. When you graduate from dental school, they should say, "Congratulations, you're a doctor of dental surgery, and you don't know shit about anything else. Stay in your lane." Um, how has the legal, how has the marriage of um, dentistry and law? How, how has it really been going that you're three and a half decades in this? Where Where's the profession headed uh, oh, dentally, boy. legally? Well, um, 
I think since the, the first time that we um, did this, uh, it's only gotten worse, I think, for the, the young dentist. It's dentistry, unfortunately, is this, this, I mean, part of it is dentists eat their young. Um, <laughs> part of it is, you know, this, this whole global takeover of, you know, by corporations, uh, you know, private equity funds, things like that. Uh, and it's also this fear. I mean, we, we can talk debt, but there's also this, this fear of risk, uh, fear of, uh, of stepping out on your own. And so it's this perfect storm that to be quite frank is quite scary for the profession and five, 10, 20 years. I, I don't know, but it's quickly and even faster than I thought it was going to be. It's quickly becoming like the MDs, like the pharmacists. And that's, that's scary. I, I would be, I would be scared out of my mind if I had $400,000 in debt and all I could be was an associate for my entire career. That would be scary for me. I, I think people always think, you know, the, the great advantage of being yeah. old is you've seen every rodeo twice. I mean, I remember from 93, 94 to 2000, stocks just kept doubling yep. and everybody thought it'd go on forever. But what goes up comes back down. Um, I've seen the, um, you know, the, these natural laws are like business cycles. Right. And so um, I've lived through four economic downturns where, you know, 1980, 1987, 2000, Lehman's brother were due for another one. Right. But during these economic um, deleveraging, um, I see all these DSOs wh where, the, uh, where their debt is public, it's all rated junk. And most of them have about 30 offices and 10 are great and 10 are okay and 10 are just dogs right and i think um in this um there's not a question if we're um gonna go through a economic deleveraging again um, i mean hell it's happened a dozen times since world war ii it's it, it, it's it's right at our doorstep but I, I think it's gonna free up a bunch of practices and i i think there's gonna be a bunch of great bargains and also on the dso I'm not, no, I, I shouldn't be arguing with my guests, but I feel like you're a friend no, please. and a brother from the yeah. same mother. Um, when, when I look at the, the, um, the maximum limit of the DSOs, I mean, basically they graduate 6,000 a year and they all work for about five years for someone else right. before, and, and they, nobody can keep their associate for a year. I don't care if it's Heartland, Aspen, or your own right. best dental office. I mean, you, you can't keep an associate happy. Um, the, um, so 6,000 times five, it's 30,000. I mean, they only, they only got about 30,000 people to play with before they're so sick of, I mean, they, they didn't go to school eight years right. to be your little boy. Well, yeah. see, that's the problem though. That's, that's the issue is there's almost like an indoctrination happening. Um, and it starts in dental school. Um, and the indoctrination is, this is the only way out of debt. The only way out of debt is to go corporate it, because you're gonna have this higher starting salary. You're going to be guaranteed you know, patients, guaranteed production, and as a result, you're gonna be able to you know, grow your salary, 150, 175, 200,000, and that's going to be, allow you to get out of debt quicker. And that's a bunch of crap. I mean, it just is. They're smart. They're they're trying to pay them just enough money to Absolutely. kill all their dreams. Yeah, it's golden golden handcuffs, right? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and the problem is, is that, I mean, we're human, and we have the same. It doesn't matter, you know, how, how you're Irish. I, I am. I am. So so now we come Irish down, are human. Well, we come <laughs> we come down to spread, you know, the the qualities. But um, the the issue is that humans we tend to rise to whatever economic level we are in terms of spending. Very few of us are going to save. Uh, and as a result, we have these golden handcuffs. I'm making 150 grand, great. I'm gonna be spending X amount per month. And it's very hard, it takes uh, a tremendous amount of discipline to say, wait a second, I still have $400,000 in debt. I need to still live like I'm a student for X amount of years, one, two, three years. And, and there, are, there are definitely a few people that can do that. But 
once you get that and once it's five, seven years in and you've got these golden handcuffs on, well, guess what? Now you're married. Now you have kids and now you can't take that risk. And so that's when they have you. And that's the problem. And they may jump from associateship to associateship, but the problem is, is they're not jumping into practice ownership if they stay five to seven years. And that's, that's the hard part. And it's harder on the boys than the girls yep. because in all culture <clears throat> study, girls marry um, wiser than boys. So almost all the girls in dental school will marry a boy in dental school and if it's not a boy dentist, it's a lawyer, physician, yeah. something. Except me, I married a much wiser woman than I, I am. So I just want to throw that out there. Um, <laughs> but so many of those um, boys um, end up marrying a girl who has visions of never working and having a house full of kids, which can all right. be great. Yeah. But the girl, but the boys suffer a lot more because the girls almost always marry someone who makes $10,000 a month. Yeah. And the boys except for the ones who married a girl in their class, just don't do that. They right. marry the best looking girl at the Waffle House. Right. And uh, and that's the most expensive waffle you're ever gonna buy. Breakfast is an important meal though. <laughs> and so so um, it, it, it's, it is truly a bigger curse um, for the boys. I loved it how you started with Dennis Ether, um, Young. So, so, okay, so you're talking to a bunch of dentists who know yep. every single thing in the world and they even know dental law more than you. They do. Because they do. Um, they're dentists. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so I just want to start. I'm just going to throw some trigger words at you. And I want you to um, try to educate them that they don't know everything, like leases. The most overlooked asset a dentist has. Um, less than half of dentists have their leases reviewed by an attorney. I would go so far as to say it's a super majority. Um, and there are, I don't care what the lease is, unless it's a lease from 1975, there are 15 to 20 provisions in that lease which can detrimentally impact the saleability, the transferability of that practice, which can significantly derail your career. Okay, she's a junior in dental school. She yep. might, what is a lease? Sure. What? A lease, so when you, whenever you have an ownership interest, whether it's a partnership, whether it's a startup, whether it's an acquisition, you are going to have a lease if you don't own the real estate. Um, but even if you own the real estate, you're going to have a lease anyway. But that lease guarantees you and protects the goodwill that you have in that practice because the landlord has a contract with you for a long-term lease. And as long as you pay your rent, you have the ability to stay there. And the reason why it's so important for a dentist is because your patients, one, most of the time they're going to be located around that lease, but more importantly, they become accustomed to where that space is. And if you're forced to leave, you're going to have patient attrition. And depending upon how far you have to move, that patient attrition can be substantial. So that's, that's what a lease is. It's it's the one asset that protects the goodwill that you're acquiring. And goodwill is the most, besides time, goodwill is the most important asset a dentist has. And you say half the dentists don't have a lawyer look at their lease. I, I would be shocked if 30% of them. Because here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. You've got, you've got a lot of brokers who are dependent on that lease getting signed. And they... A lot of them, not all of them, um, hold themselves out as as most people do, being an expert, and they don't. All of them volunteer. You should probably have an attorney look at it. Now they'll say that somewhere in a document, but if I'm telling you face to face, looking you in the eye, saying, "Hey, you brought me on to do the business points. I don't do all of the legal points. You really need to get an attorney." That's very different than it being in the fifth paragraph of the contract that you signed with me. So um, there are definitely, and I, I want to be clear, there definitely are brokers out there that encourage the use of attorneys, but you have so many parties. You have equipment reps that are dependent on that startup. You have, you know, you've got contractors, you've got architects, you've got all these people who are dependent on that lease being signed they do not want an impediment. And who is the impediment? The attorney. 
because we're going to find things. And if it's substantial enough, for instance, the landlord has the right, if you go to sell your practice in the future, the landlord has the right to terminate your lease. That's kind of a substantial issue that we want to take care of. But in the vast majority of leases that have been written since 2000, almost all of them have that language in there. And yet... That it's not transferable upon the sale. No, no, no. That, that I, the landlord, can say, I accept the assignment to your buyer. I reject the assignment to your buyer. Or you ask me for an assignment, I'm going to instead terminate your lease. Meaning you're out. Now, do the landlords really want to terminate your lease? No, they don't. But we've seen so many landlords use that as what's called legal extortion. Well, I'm going to terminate your lease, but let's, you know, if you want to give me 50 grand, I'll reconsider. Happens all the time. Now, all the time, still very small percentage, you know, but obviously that can derail a career. And it's this small little one sentence in a 35-page document that's eight-point font. And then think about the reverse about this when you go to sell your practice right. and you own the land and building. When you sell your practice to a dentist, everything he's talking about is why you have such a good tenant because in re commercial real estate, the biggest variable is do you have a tenant? Right. So when you sell your dental office to, when you're 65 and sell to some puppy and um, after they say uh, they rent, they sign a 10 year lease yep. while they pay off the dental office, at the end of that 10 years, they don't wanna move. I mean, everybody, Everything he said that was negative is now good. They, they, everybody's familiar with this location. They all want to go there. So I've seen so many dentists sell their practice and carry the paper. Uh, so now they get a 10%. I mean, you know, what are bonds paying? 2%? They'll get a 10%. You know, they'll carry the paper 10%, 10 years. And then as soon as she's done, now you have a um, captive uh, tenant to now go buy the property again. Right. And then you carry that paper. Now you get another payment for another 10 years. I know dentists that carried their own paper, sold their practice, and then their real estate had a 20-year yep. retirement payout. Um, and if you really, I mean, uh, what I love is being able to then utilize that to acquire additional assets. Because if you've got a tenant that's going to be there 10, 15, 20 years, it's a bankable tenant, less than a 1% default rate, you're darn right I'm going to be using that equity to buy and acquire additional assets because time value of money, things like that, it's going to set you into a completely different plateau in terms of economics. And unfortunately, too many dentists don't think that way. Um, we, we need to think globally as it relates to our practice, our real estate, and, and really not just completely have one industry, i.e. dentistry, captivating all of our wealth. We need to spread that out somewhere. So you've done 7,000 dental transitions. Um, does it begin with a purchase agreement? What, what is a purchase agreement? So a purchase agreement is a contract between a buyer and a seller to purchase something. I mean, it's whatever it is. And in this context, it's a dental practice. And I am the seller. I am selling you a dental practice. And buyer, I'm buying the practice. But what exactly am I buying? I'm buying used equipment. I'm buying patients that I hope are going to come and see me. And that's really it. I mean, that's how scary it is. And, and that's why goodwill is considered blue sky because it's this un intangible asset where it's very close to religion because it's a faith that those patients are going to come see you again. And so that's really what you're acquiring. And it may sound scary, but the, the reality is, is people are creatures of habit. And so I'm probably going to give that buyer one shot. And, and physicians don't really sell their practice anymore, do they? If they're specialists, if they've been able to avoid the, I'll call it the hospitalization of the medical industry, um, then yes. And, and they can be very profitable. Plastic surgeons, um, chiropractors, you know, the, the specialists that maybe are a lot of fee-for-service or PPO-based, they still can command good money. But your family practitioners, you know, your OBGYNs, all that, no. Because if you open up a practice as a family physician in Phoenix, the minute you sign up <clears> with <throat> Medicare and Medicaid, you're booked out yeah. into, so, so there's no value of selling a practice if it, I, if 
I just signed up for Medicaid and I'm right. Well, the, so and that that's also partially true with dental practices. You know, Medicaid practices are, tend to sell for less than a PPO practice. An HMO practice will tend to sell for less than a, a PPO or, or a fee for service. Um, the, the difference between the medical industry and the, the dental industry is it's not just the, the Medicare, Medicaid. It's the fact that hospitals have been able to control most of the touch points in the practice of medicine. And with those touch points comes the, for lack of a better term, the siphoning off of the profits into the larger corporations. And so those family practitioners that used to make three, four, t- five times what they used to make, they're, they're making less than what doctors made in 1980. And so, um, it, People don't buy those practices. Why would you? You're not really profiting a ton from that. Juxtapose that to dental practices. Dental practices still roughly 40%, if I'm talking a GP, 40% profit, which is exactly why private equity is basically tripping over themselves to get into this field because I can pay, I can satisfy all debts and still have when I've taken into account all of these factors, I'm still much higher than manufacturing. I'm still much higher than, you know, most of the other industries that I would otherwise be putting my money into. And with low rate environment, it's like a no brainer. My, my return on capital is so big because of the profitability in dentistry. And that's what a lot of these, uh, a lot of young doctors need to understand is you are in one of the most profitable industries in the United States. And you need to understand, one, there's a tax code issue there where as being a practice owner, every dollar you make is worth 10 to 15% more than that same dollar as an employee. Um, But also you are receiving these profits. And so when you compare apples to apples, doctor production as an employee versus doctor production as an owner, you're making about double the income because of the profits associated with owning the practice, the tax code that treats and favors business owners. And that's, that's what a lot of the young doctors don't understand. Go over the tax code more. So if you're an employee and you may, how is it different as a dentist making a dollar as an employee versus a dentist making a dollar as an owner? Great question. So as an employee, you are taxed at the highest taxable rate that you can be taxed at. That's, you know, welcome to America. Um, And so if I'm making 150,000, I am making what I'm going to be taxed at the highest rate I can at the $150,000 mark. Now, 150,000, most DSOs are paying between 25 and 30% of collections. So if I'm making 150,000, that means I'll just call it 25% because it's easier and I'm an attorney, not a mathematician. So 150,000 means that my doctor production is 600,000. My doctor collections are 600,000. So I should have brought a whiteboard. Um, So 600,000, I make 150 grand as an employee. 600,000 as a practice owner is also gonna generate 25 to 30% of that is supposed to be hygiene. So I'm generating what is that? Another two hundred thousand? We'll call it one hundred and fifty to be fair. Um, one hundred and seventy-five, but uh, seven hundred and fifty. So that six hundred thousand is going to generate a total of seven hundred fifty thousand. Now, assuming normal ADA uh, profitability, we'll call it forty percent. It hovers right around there. You're looking at seven hundred and fifty of total production associated with that practice leaves you with three hundred grand. Now, granted, there's perks and things like that. But so as a business owner, what do I get to do? Well, I get to write things off that I otherwise wouldn't uh, as an employee. And with the the Trump tax cuts, as a professional, you basically can't write anything off anymore. As a business owner, though, you still have all of these deductions. Those deductions suppress and reduce your tax burden. And so that 300,000 is probably conservatively worth an additional 20 or 30,000 given the tax code. Um, 
add in retirement plans, add in all these other factors. I mean, it, you know, when you extrapolate over 20, 25 years, we're, we're not talking a difference between 150,000. We're talking the difference of five to $10 million. Yeah. When you folk, when you factor in compound interest, when you factor in time value money, when you factor in investment rate returns, all that stuff. Let me know if you guys have fallen asleep yet. But. No, and it's another thing. So, so, so you're a guy and yeah. you marry a girl in your class who makes yep. ten thousand a month. Yep. From twenty five to sixty five, versus a girl who stays home and spends ten thousand a month. That that's a ten million dollar difference. There you go. That's plus five to minus five. Yeah. And when you look at um, a dentist as an associate versus a dentist as an employee, uh, the um, the dentist who owns their own practices average two hundred and forty-five thousand a year, and the dentists who are employees are one forty-five. So it's a hundred thousand dollars a year more net income for a general dentist who owns as opposed to an employee. Just like specialists, um, they average three twenty, where a general practitioner is one ninety-seven. So dental specialists three twenty, us uh, two hundred. So you, so if you're a senior in dental school. You'll net an extra one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year if you go on and specialize in anything, and when you get out of school, if you just open up your own damn practice, you'll make a hundred more than being an employee. And follow the blood. Oral surgeons make the most at four fifty. Periodontist next three thirty. Endo three oh seven. Pediatric dentist three oh four. And then now we're leaving blood. Orthodontist two eighty nine. Um, Prosthodontist Crown and Bridge two nineteen. Um, there's, I mean, you're a doctor and doctors work on humans and humans are filled with blood. So when you come out of school and you say, I, 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 I don't like bloody stuff. I don't like extractions and root canals and implants. Um, well, you should have been an engineer. I mean, how the hell did you um, want to be a doctor with no blood? And then, um, um, so that's a purchase agreement. Um, and there's lots of things that can go right or wrong with that. Um, I always wonder, you know, marriages fall apart and they're costly. When you're looking at partnerships agreements, is that kind of a marriage too? And do they um, fall apart? And, you know, you tell them when they get married, you say, dude, you got to have a prenuptial agreement. Right. But they never will. Right. And uh, it, it's hard to get a girl to sign a prenup when you're in the back seat of the car and she's upside down and you can't, you know, the pen and... Um, but a partnership agreement, it seems like I, I, I can understand the no prenup on the emotional love thing, but on a partnership agreement, how could you not have that? And does it spell out a clear exit strategy? And do you see divorce rates and partnership breakups the same way? Are they different? Are they as common? Um, so the, the three, and I was just having this conversation earlier today, the, the three main reasons why partnerships fall apart. Lack of money, divorce, and no written agreement. I mean, that, that, those are the three top things, uh, you know. This Lack of money, divorce, and no written agreement. And no. Really, they get married with no written agreement. Yeah, well, you know, sometimes partners wow. get in the backseat of a car, too. So Wow. Um, but, uh, yeah, that I mean, I, look, I love partnerships. I also hate them. Uh, and I believe it was you that said partnerships are basically like marriage without the sex. So, yeah. Yeah. So, um, M marriage has a lot of glue between sex and children and vacations and extended family. It's a lot of glue. Yeah. But when there's no glue right. and the other thing is, you know, with a, you know, <coughs> your wife and kids aren't in your face all day long, but man, if, if you're a partner and you're doing something, say, say you're doing crappy dentistry right? and eight hours a day, I, I'm looking at your composites with no contact, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's in your face <laughs> all day long. Right. If you're at the office, it's in the face. It, it just, it's brutal. Yeah. I, I think that <sighs> so many people rush into partnerships. They don't think about things. They don't, you know, ah, oh, it's, you know, my friend from dental school or it's my father, or it's my sister or whatever. And they don't spend the time to really analyze it. And that, that's the problem with partnerships. You need, if you're going to, I mean, let's, let's stay on the marriage angle. Do you, would you really marry someone if you didn't know everything about them? Well, maybe some of us would, but you need to know everything about this person. 
What's their patient philosophy? What's their, what's their outlook on life? Here we go. Are they happy in their marriage? Is this their first marriage or is it their third marriage that they're on? I'll just tell you right now, never get into a partnership with someone who's been divorced more than once. It just, it's not going to work. Um, now, am I 100% accurate on that? No, but I'm probably like 98.7%. So there's, there's just a lot that goes into a partnership. And the problem is, is everyone rushes past all of those issues and they, they get, literally get into bed with the partner. And then lo and behold, this doesn't work. Or... They do everything right. They talk about all these things. And then they go and buy a practice that's only doing five or 600000 Well, now we're in a lack of money. Oh, well, we both have associate jobs. Okay, well, what happens when that associate loses their job? Oh, you didn't talk about that. And now that associate is working at the practice all the time, and now you're upset because they've taken all of your patients. Okay, well... We should have thought about that. So there's just a lot of things that go into it. Um, really quick, my my framework for partnerships, um, if you're trying to buy a practice, you should be looking at a practice doing, again, GP specialist. There's different numbers, but GP practices should be doing about $1.5 million. For two people. For two people. The partnership. So $750 each. $750 each. Or we're on track to get to one five. Maybe if you're one three, but hey, we're on track to do one five then yes, you can buy in to that practice. But if they're only doing seven or 800, that's, that's not enough to adequately support two doctors. And so I, I use one, 1. 1.5 million because that's 750,000 of production per doctor, which, which transfers to about 600,000 of doctor production per doctor. Divide that by 12, you're at 50 grand a month. 50 grand a month is doable for almost every dentist out there. But when I start to I start to reduce that number and we break it down to a million, well now, million we're at seven hundred fifty thousand dollars of doctor production divided by two that's three seventy five, divided by twelve that's thirty one thousand and change, that's not enough to support. And so, that's the problem with so again, lack of money. Divorce. You didn't properly, you know, evaluate your partner. You didn't analyze the, the non-dental aspects of the partnership. Um, are they happy in their life? Are they happy in their marriage? You know, how are their kids? I mean, is, is all of that comes into the partnership, whether you like it or not. Uh, and then last but not least, yeah, we didn't really feel like we needed to do a written agreement because we talk, you know, we just understand each other. Well, good luck because... I guarantee you there's going to be things that fall apart because of miscommunication. So, so what type of person have you noticed that really loves partnerships the most and they work? What, what, what's going on? My most that? successful clients are female-female partnerships. Females get shared sacrifice, shared reward. I mean, I might have even said this last time. They live with us. So they, they totally understand sacrifice. Um, <laughs> by living with men. By, by living with men. <laughs> so, um, but... Yeah. When I and when I talk about um, when I talk about success, I'm talking about not money. I'm talking about quality of life, everything. Um, it allows them to have lives outside of dentistry. One of the biggest things that solo practitioners say is, "I I can never just leave. I can never just go. I'm 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 chained to this practice, and, and that's understandable. I I totally get where that's coming from." Uh, partnerships allow for that freedom. And it also allows, and this is why I love female-female partnerships, because if you, if you look at the ADA, I think it's called um, an industry in transition, female dentists, who now are a, a majority of dentists, are one half, <clears throat> one half or 50% as likely as their male counterparts to acquire a practice. And so there's a huge divide between females They're and males. One half is likely one half, yes. to buy I think a practice. It's, I think it's 63% um, males will acquire 38% of females. I could be off on my, on my percentages. Um, it's, it's a little bit old now, but it's, um, I, I believe it's called an industry in transition. And 
this and one of the biggest issues that that females are uh, face or to be quite frank are indoctrinated with uh, in dental school is you can't be a mom and be a practice owner and that I can't tell you how much that frustrates me and angers me uh, because there is no better profession to be a mom and to be an owner than dentistry. Um, and so my female, female partnerships, what, you know, one of them will take their kids to school and the other one will pick their kids up, meaning that we've got a slightly shifted schedule so that our personal lives are being handled. So one's going in to work a little bit earlier, one's going in to work a little bit later. And they love it. And I, I think it's great. I think it, it, it's a great work-life balance. Um, so I, I just, it's one of my pet peeves that we, we have to do something to decrease that differential between males and females. It, it has to, it has to become more on par. Yeah. Um, I am, um, man, I, 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 if I was going to be a super mom, I would rather just, I, I don't want when Megan has a play tomorrow at school, I don't want right. to come into work and ask the office manager if I can get tomorrow off. Right. Uh, I, I think um, the most super moms I see that are women dentists, they own their own practice. And if they want to go to Muffy's play tomorrow, they, they just go. And, and if they wake up and two kids are sick and puking, they yep. just, they, they call in sick. Um, Absolutely. Um, so um, shareholder agreements, what are those? Shareholder agreements are, okay, so I am not a fan of single entity partnerships. That is the cheap way of doing things. It's the lazy way of doing things. Um, and You're it, not a fan of what? what we're talking about right now. So a shareholder agreement is when two partners are entering into a single entity partnership. So that's where the shareholder agreement comes in. Um, and so it's two individuals that are, let's call it 50, 50 partners in a single entity. That is a, a cheaper way of doing a partnership. Partnerships, in my opinion, should be multi entity. So each doctor should have their own entity. And then depending upon what state you're in, you're in, you're either doing a general partnership agreement or you have a parent company that sits on top. The reason for that, again, taxes, protection of liability. When you have a single entity, is it, is it slightly cheaper to set up? Absolutely. Um, but you run into problems with taxes because now you have to agree on taxes every year. If you want to be aggressive, and write everything off, Costco, Hawaii, you know, well, whatever. Um, and I don't, we're going to fight about it. And it happens all the time. And so it becomes issues as it relates to how we deal with um, salaries versus dividends and, and all these other aspects, which can fray and cause a partnership to kind of start to crumble a little bit. And over time, that tends to build up. There's also, there's also more liability associated with a single entity shareholder agreement because now we're part of the same entity. So things that you do impact me. So things like, things like uh, sexual harassment, things like uh, wrongful termination. If one partner did that by themselves and I have my own entity and this person, he or she have their own entity, I can have liability protection there um, versus being a part of the same entity. Now everything's up for grabs. Now, are we still protected from all of our other uh, personal aspects? Yes. But this whole entity now that I'm a part of is now in play because of the liability associated with what that other partner did. So it's, we do them. I don't love them. But um, that is basically a, a shareholder agreement is when you're doing a partnership. This is probably the most common question that you get tired of asking. Um, Dennis always want to know, should I be a corporation? You should have an entity. Um, now, obviously, as an employee, you can't. Um, but as, uh, as a practice owner, absolutely. There's, there's protection. There's liability protection. Again, and 
Um, there's great CPAs out there that you might want to talk to, but um, you have, I guess I should be careful since the IRS may be listening, but um, you have the ability to write things off more. Um, they're not red flags when you are an entity, whether it's an LLC, a professional corporation, a, a PA, whatever. You have the ability to write things off that will not necessarily trigger audits as they would as a sole pri uh, proprietor. But, but back to what you just said, corporation, LLC, PA, <clears throat> right? Um, how, how do they determine that? Uh, it depends on the state. So um, there's only a few states that only allow doctors to be a PC, which is a professional corporation. In most states, they'll allow an LLC. And typically, you're going to want, if an LLC or a PLLC is available, you're typically going to want that instead. It provides a slight bit more of uh, the ability to play around with taxes based upon certain thresholds. And so, again, talk to your CPA about that um, because there are some... Because as an LLC, you don't have to make an S election. You can be a sole proprietor. You can you can do other aspects. And then when it makes sense to jump to an S uh, an S election, then you can jump to the S election. So you can you're basically shifting things around until you get to a certain point. So, but again, talk to your CPA. Hopefully, it's a dental CPA, and hopefully, it's not just a dental CPA who calls themselves a dental CPA, but one that actually knows what they're talking about. This next one's a long question. I got to throw okay. a bunch of mud on the wall. Go. We're going to talk about associate agreements, but if you're the young kid out of school, right. um, the the big boys, the Heartlands, the Aspens, the the um, Pacific Dentals, right. they tell you, "Hey, this is our contract. Yep. We don't change it for anybody." When they go to my friends and homies, it could be anything from written on a bar napkin to a handshake. Yep. Um, um, should my friends be Hiring associates um, at a brewery, at a microbrewery, over a cheeseburger. Um, um, if it's after five, I mean, sure. If it's but after five, if it's so twelve. If it's eleven thirty, maybe not. So, so, what what can you tell us about associate contracts? Let's start start with is when she goes and applies at Aspen. Is that a boilerplate contract where they cannot change it? Is, is she no. wasting her time showing it no. to an attorney? So, um, there you have to be very selective. Um, with what you go after. Um, I tend to limit, and I, I, I spend time, um, I basically do it for a ridiculously expensive bottle of wine um, rather than charge them the two grand that it would cost. Um, but basically, you have to be selective in how you approach. So some of the things that we talk about are, um, what do you want to do? After this, what do you want to do? Do you want to stay in the area? Is this just a job? Like, tell me about what your short and long-term plans are because what you tell me is going to dictate how I approach the, the restrictive covenants that they're going to be pushing. Now, if you're not going to be in that area, then I'm going to give on restrictive covenants to maybe get a bump in compensation or to get you a set schedule. Now, why is a set schedule so important? Well, a lot of these um, corporations, a lot, basically a lot of these owners, I'll call them owners, whether it's uh, private practice or corporate dentistry, they're only going to give you three or four days. Now, if I can establish a schedule from Monday through Thursday, rather than you being at the beck and whim of, of whoever your employer is, I've now established a schedule so that you can go to another owner and say, hey, I've got Friday and Saturday available. So now you're, again, if we're trying to get out of debt, now I have the ability to work five or six days rather than what they're offering me. But if I don't protect myself when I'm agreeing to the contract, they can put me on Mondays and Saturdays and Fridays, and now I'm, I'm not a marketable asset. So, um, so we tend to focus on Establishing a schedule, restrictive covenants, compensation, and by the way, I don't care if it's private practice or if it's corporate practice, you need to know what that practice is producing. Because if you are not 
ridiculously busy, your hand speed isn't going to increase. If your hand speed doesn't increase, guess what? You make less money. If you make less money, you can't qualify for higher loans, which means you can't go after those bigger practices, which have more cash flow. More cash flow allows you to satisfy debt over a quicker period of time, which means that you can then get out of debt quicker. So it really matters about that first associateship. And I don't mind going into corporate. I, I Trust me, they are going to use and abuse you. You might as well use and abuse them back. So go to every single CE that they have about case acceptance, about patient-doctor interactions, about uh, you know mannerisms and, and how to sell and do it all because I want you to learn as much as possible. I want that hand speed to be as fast as possible so that we are ready after a year or two to go and own our own practice. And, so. what, and what, what I can't believe is just how bottom feeding your attitude is like you'll go work for like say heartland has the the largest you know they they almost have a thousand locations right and um and i'll say well gosh you know they they ran a thousand locations and what what, what how did how do they do it what, what was their accounting software right. don't know um you know i mean you ask them like well, what's what's the code for a, a, a filling they, they, they don't know any business yeah. And then the geniuses, you know what the geniuses do? They go work at these, uh, some um, DSO with, like say, I, 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 I can't, I don't like referring to DSOs, Heartland, Aspen, and right. Pacific, because the lion's share of DSOs are usually like four or five offices. Would, would we you? have a ton, I mean, I, remember, I'm in both worlds, right? So I, I, we have DSOs that are clients. Um, and, uh, you know, I, obviously I took a, we took a big hit because I've been a very strong proponent of ownership, private uh, practice ownership. And we, we took a pretty big hit um, when I came out all over Dentaltown and, and other places that, hey, look, you have to do this. Um, but you have to do it. You, you have to own. Like if you don't, yeah. in, in this generation, if this generation doesn't, it's always, it's always like millennial bashing and things like that. But it's not, I mean, you have to take the risk because if you don't take the risk, you you're going to be in debt. You are not going to get. Did ahead. you get a lot of pushback from that stance? Oh heck yeah, we yeah. lost a lot of a lot of money. And so, but obviously I gained I gained. But, but, but talk too. about that. What 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 exact was it? A, um, was it a post on downtown or was it a? a what, well, what, what it's triggered it all? yeah. I mean, basically, uh, it was a call to action. Um, to, there was a law in Texas that was happening. Um, and basically it was whether or not DSOs would continue to be legal in Texas. And so, you know, started a thread, obviously is, I, I just want full information. I mean, if you want to be a numbskull and not do anything with the information, then, then so be it. But I, I like people that have full information. I love educating. So anyways, so we came out against that law and, um, yeah, within, Do you remember what the thread was called? I don't know. Um, but anyways, it was, it, you have some threads that have 5,600. I mean, you are the man on the, this is your space on dental town. Uh, always has been, uh, but anyway, um, so anyway, I, it's, I don't know where we were going with that, but we talk, we talk about associate. Well, oh, so yeah, associates. So yeah. Some some people are very um, concerned about DSOs, and I mean, I, I I again, I just I just like to see evidence. I, I see them again. I'll just go back to the math. There's six thousand graduates. They it takes them five years. I'm, uh, think about this yourself. If, if what you're saying makes so much sense, then prove me wrong. You should go five years back in dental school, get the list of graduates and show me how they're all happily practicing as an associate somewhere else. Okay, well, I've I've lived through this for 32 years. And when I go find dentists five years out of school, they've had five different associate jobs, private, high scale, um, mm -hmm. high fee, low volume, private, low fee, high volume, um, associate, everything. I mean, dentists, you make horrible employees. After you go to college eight years, you, you, you're not a good employee and um, you're not happy. So you have to go around sticking your tongue in a light socket probably once a year for five years. And then finally, the only reason you set out, you buy your own practice is because 
the fear of that unknown is less than the pain that you've been living for five years. And, um, and I don't care what DSOs have done the last 10 years. I, I've seen the linear thinking up every mountain. I've scaled the mountain up four times and I've watched everybody come back down four times and um, we're getting ready to deleverage again. Um, so I, I don't buy it, but, but if they were in, um, um, I, I mean, <laughs> uh, but back to the ones that worked at Harlan, here's the geniuses. <clears throat> They'll go work for um, some big DSO or, you know, like say most DSOs, I, I would say the range for me at DSO is like somewhere between five and 30 practices, but everybody talks about these outliers that have several hundred. And so the sharp kid will go work for this DSO and be some town in North Dakota and they right. got four offices, north, south, east, and west. What do you do? He buddied up to the sharpest front office girl yep. in that whole organization. And she Jeez, said, man. you know what we had to do? We had to go to the next town over in Grand Rapids. Absolutely. We'd kill it there. So it's people, time, and money. They, they go work at Heartland and they sit there and they, they say um, either they learn the business systems or they find the person that they have chemistry with that for some reason they want to break out on their own. I mean, right. would you rather be the smallest goldfish in in the ocean or would you rather be the biggest goldfish? So so they'll go find someone who's um maybe three management tiers down and that'll be the new office manager and they open up and they just crush it. But would you um would you recommend that they're in dental school if they're looking for associate? What what's the pros and cons of going to a DSO versus a private practice? Okay, so no matter where you're going to go, I, you should have the thought process of 900 to a million dollars in revenue. Okay. That should be in the background of your mind. Okay. What is the practice doing? Because remember, you're going into a practice that already has a provider. So if you're going into say private practice where there's only 600,000 in revenue, guess what? You're not, you're not needed. Even 900 to a million you're going to be working on overflow. You're going to be working on on basically growing the practice, but there's still 900 a million. You're still going to be getting patients. You're still going to be getting some of those better cases rather than just filling, 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 filling. Um, same thing with DSOs, though. Same thing with with small DSOs, medium, large. You need to know what that practice is doing. So for every provider there should be 900 to a million dollars of revenue so that when you come in, you're going to be busy. Um, so that's, that's my, and by the way, if you're too afraid to ask that, it's probably a little too late, but you pick the wrong profession to get into because you're going to have to be having these conversations eight, 12, 16, 30 times a day with your patients. If you can't respect yourself enough to be asking these questions, then that's a concern. Um, there, and by the way, any owner that doesn't want to offer that to you, that should be a red flag for you because you have to be busy as an associate. Otherwise, you're never going to get out of this debt. And success is directly related to how many uncomfortable conversations you're going to have. When, Absolutely. When you, when you go join a team, they always want to start with, how's the wife, how's the dog, how's the kid? Not why did we lose the ball game last night by 25 points right. and why, you know, why, you know, was, you know, why am I work walking into a no shows cancellations? This person's hasn't been, hasn't made their last three appointments. So, so your social animal stuff wants you to get along with everybody, but really successful people, um, for some reason they can talk about all the unsuccessful stuff. And also remember another thing, so much of the, um, those who do, do, and those who can't teach, and you're always believing um, your dental school instructors who could never have a million dollar practice. You said it, not me. I mean, my God, it's <laughs> like, well, who told you that? Oh, doctor never did it, who's been an employee at a dental school for 25 years. I, I mean, my God, um, the only saving grace of dental school are like my friends who crush it Monday through Thursday. Yeah. But out of boredom and fun, they love to teach Friday yep. for like 200 bucks a day, yep. which they could go to their office and do that from like 8 to 8.30. Right. But they love to teach. Yep. They love the kids. They don't listen to the politics. I mean, maybe that one guy who comes in one day a week, talk to that guy. But career-long dental school instructors, and you're quoting them like the Bible, I mean... 
you, if you want to quote them, that should be on your not ever do list. Well, all my instructors said, be sure to do this and this would happen. So now, you know, that's exactly never going to happen. Yeah. So they, they're going to bracket. Um, it just blows my mind. Um, so don't listen to your professors about things they've never done. Uh, if your professor teaches endo and he's done 10,000 root canals, Absolutely. yeah, that, that that's totally different than um, his views on private practice and marketing and DSOs and all that kind of stuff. Um, this is Dennis Rand Censored, so I'm going to talk about some really um, crazy stuff. Um, have you noticed anything dentist advantage of, say, young versus old, men versus women, or can ethnicity affect uh, a business, a dental office uh, transaction. Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and it's funny because I, I obviously I deal with this all the time, but it's amazing the amount. Uh, we, as a society, we've been indoctrinated that we're all equal. This is gonna be good. Oh, no, it's gonna be good. <laughs> you got all the people hitting off right now. Some popcorn. Yeah. I'm re- I'm ready to to hear this. Yeah, one. we we've been indoctrinated that we're all equal. Okay. And that we, and, and by the way, if you're all equal, you're not exceptional in anything either. And so we're, we're preconditioned not to talk about things that are, that are taboo. Um, to not talk about the fact that I'm a, I'm a first generation Korean doctor and I'm looking at a first generation Japanese doctor's practice. And I go in there and the staff speaks Japanese. Um, but I really like the cash flow. I mean, it's a great practice. It's doing like 1.2 million. And everybody's told me I should buy this. Okay. And by the way, this is, this is something that has happened. I mean, I, I can, right. I'll, we'll extrapolate after, but so the doctor was taken aback when I said, do you speak Japanese? Well, no. Why does that matter? Okay. So you're first generation Korean. You want to buy a first generation Japanese practice where the patient base is first generation generation Japanese. They speak Japanese. Do you by any chance know any history regarding the, the Japanese and the Korean people? Yeah, you guys have hated each other for a long time. Now... That is different than second or third generation, same Korean Japanese, where English is spoken or, th- or we have a multi-ethnic practice. Then ethnicity is not an issue. By the way, it's not just ethnicity. It, it, can, be, it can be religion. If you are a non-LDS person who's trying to buy an LDS person's practice, that is a big issue. Yeah, like in a small town in Idaho. Absolutely, a small yeah. town in Idaho. You, I uh. mean, you just you follow the Mormon road, and it should be a question. Especially, uh, this is kind of a joke, but especially if the last name is Smith. So, um, as in Joseph Smith. <laughs> so, um, but it's it's just it, it's these questions that you have to know because, again, I I hate to break it to you, but. Humans are prejudicial. Whether or not you're doctrinated or not, you are prejudicial the closer you are to whatever it is. And what I mean by that is if you are a first generation whatever, you're going to be closer to the, that first generation that you come from than your children who are second generation are going to be. And if you are in if you are a small or smaller a religion where it is not the dominant religion, then you're going to be gravitating towards the same like-minded people in a smaller town, smaller area, or even in a large metropolitan area. And so to not ask those questions, I I think is malpractice. Um, It's not obviously dental malpractice. It's just life malpractice. And so, but you need to understand the difference between all these factors so I don't care, again, if I have a patient base that is, I'll just say multi-ethnic or multi-religious or whatever. If, if the doctor themselves 
have not cultivated that type of environment, it's not an issue. So you really, rather than analyzing the doctor's ethnicity or sometimes doctor's sexuality, which is an issue as well sometimes, you have to analyze the patient base. And so, and, and that's what so few people do. And again, if it's second generation, third generation, not an issue. If, if I'm in San Francisco, just because it is a gay male that is the seller doesn't mean that if I'm a heterosexual female or heterosexual male, I can't buy that practice. It matters on the practice patients. What have they done? Uh, how have they marketed? How have they extrapolated out? I always tell all my clients, never cater to your strength. If you are in a if you have some benefit, you speak Spanish, you speak Russian, you speak whatever, never cater to it because those, those individuals are going to find you anyway. But you don't want to alienate others by having that be the presence in the practice. That's just my personal That is opinion. so well said because one violation I will see, especially in Phoenix, yeah, um, um, uh, Indian doctor. Mm-hmm. As a practice. And before you know it, every single employee is Indian. Yep. So is the decor, the music, the, uh, the whole thing. And and so then it starts to become foreign Absolutely. in their own zip code. Yep. And you said, don't cater that. Look, if you're an Indian dentist and you speak Hindi, all the Indian friends are going to know it. Yep. But always make sure uh, the people answering your phone are a reflection of your economy. Absolutely. And, and I always could get the low-hanging fruit because um, when I opened up in Ahwatukee, I mean, it looked like it was downtown England. Right. And I it was across street from the um, 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 Guadalupe Indian Reservation. Interesting. And so, I mean, I always had at least a quarter of my staff could speak Spanish as a primary language. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm right next to South Phoenix, which is the most African-American community. I've always had the most African Americans in my answering my phone. Um, no one else seems to have looked at a map right. of the demographics yep. of my area. And, that, and, and, and when I say don't cater to your strength, that that's exactly what I'm talking about. You're you've analyzed where you're at, and you have you have just like America, we're supposed to be the great melting pot, right? So your practice is a melting pot of your area. It isn't all white. It isn't all Spanish. It isn't all, you know, whatever. So it is in the dental, most all the dental offices across the street from mine, you would, you would think you were in, yeah. Right. You know, some small town in Northern London. Pass the tea, please. Yeah. 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 So that, that is so neat. I've never heard anyone say, um, would you call it? Don't cater to your strengths. Yeah. Because the, the, your strengths are obviously going to find out um, your strengths, but cater to, um, reality. Um, (laughs) <laughs> it's so important. Um, when should they hire a CPA, a dental consultant, a broker? And, and then, and then how do, I mean, how do they know if, if they're any good? I mean, do you go to Google reviews? Is it Yelp reviews? How, how do you find a dental CPA, a dental consultant, a dental broker, um, and, and, and know that they're good as opposed to they market well or, they were endorsed by my local dental society, which, which is how, how, right. How, which is pay, which right. is money. Yeah. Right. I mean, how do you get the ADA endorsement for your toothpaste? You spend 1.5 million. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I remember, um, my very good friend who owned Denmat, Bob Ibsen. <clears throat> um, he used to, um, tell me in great stories about how, um, to get any of his Denmat products ADA approved, it was just a, it was like a mafia shakedown yep. for money. And they had to decide, um, do dentists even care? Uh, how much is this shakedown? But he said, it, but it was zero merit based um, right. decision. Yep. It was money, the answer, what's the question? So, so how does my young homie, she's a senior in dental school. And she needs a dental CPA. She needs a dentist broker. She needs a dental consultant. Uh, Uh, So I'm probably going to get killed for most of this, but that's fine. It's uncensored. So um, I don't think that you need a dental CPA when you're an associate. I think you can get away with QuickBooks. I think you can get away with, you know, whatever software program you want. Uh, I do believe that you need a dental CPA. when you are looking at any type of ownership, 
uh, whether that's startup, partnerships, acquisitions. When you're moving into that phase, I think you need to get a dental CPA. Uh, to be quite frank, I think you need, and this just uh, this applies to all your advisors. This is a small industry, and there are many advisors that are beholden to the people that they are being referred by. And as a result, oftentimes you don't get impartial advice. Um, for better or for worse, I tend to put my feet in my mouth quite often. And I have a lot of people mad at me all the time um, because it, uh, I, I believe that it is our job, whether it's an attorney, a CPA, a consultant, whatever, to provide our clients with full knowledge and then allow them to make the decision. Um, that doesn't always happen in this industry because people pull their punches because they're worried about the next referral. So you really, and the problem is, is you're really, as a dentist, you're really not going to know until it's too late if you've got a good advisor or not. Uh, that's the reality of the situation. Um, there are 50 people, 60 people in, in the United States that know 80 to 85% of what our firm does. Most of the time, you're probably going to be fine. But if you need that 15 to 20%, there's probably only 10 to maybe 15 attorneys in the entire United States that have done this enough, that understand it enough, the nuances and how to do this and how to do that. Um, and that's the problem. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you in trouble because I'm going to ask about one of your competitors. One of your competitors likes to, says, you know, when Jason's representing selling the practice and you got a lawyer buying the practice, right. the, the, they're just going to go to war. We dual represent. We're going to represent both of you and we're going to get this deal done. Uh, if it's and an that name is Alan F. Thornburg, um, AFCO. Um, dual well, representation. Well, I think uh, I, I, I don't get Christmas presents from the Thornburgs. <laughs> so um, he's so adorable. He when his first son was a daughter, right. Alan named her Alana. <laughs> God, I love that guy. But uh, but do you love the dual representation? Uh, it's an impossibility. I mean, it's by the way, it's an impossibility today. It's been an impossibility since biblical times when Solomon, you know, came forth and said, "Hey, you can't serve two masters." So the the, the reality is is if I'm representing both sides. My advice is going to harm one side or the other. It's just, it is. If I say the covenant should be three years and I put that in my contract, that is making a statement, whether I like it or not. Now, if I come back with an allocation that is 85% goodwill, that is making a statement one way or the other that is benefiting the seller more than it's benefiting the buyer. There are, I'll just use, I'll say dual agent brokers rather than a specific company. Those contracts are usually some of the worst for buyers uh, in terms of representation protection. So they're biased of, towards the seller. Yes. Well, again, like you said before with the ADA, follow the money. Who's paying the vast majority of the commission? The seller. So you have allocations that are tailored towards the seller. You have purchase prices that are tailored towards the seller. You have restrictive covenants that are tailored towards the seller. So though, and, and understand, I, I, I work on AFCO deals and to be, you know, to be fair to AFCO, uh, you know, there's, uh, I, I know what to expect. And I know, you know, I know what I can ask for and to a large part I will get as opposed to other dual agent brokers who are worse, much worse. Um, I still don't like dual agent brokers because it's, it's an issue for me, just like it would be an issue for me as an attorney to be representing both sides uh, or a CPA to be representing the seller and the buyer. 
it's just it, it shouldn't be done. Um, there's a lot of um, people that believe, and not just consultants who make a living off of consulting, that if you were going to buy, let's say the average price, is it fair to say the, would you say the average practice sold is 750 or would you say it's now a million? It really, I think it really depends on the locality and the state. Yeah. Um, for me, I think those practices that are producing less than 500 are very, very hard to sell given debt thresholds and things like that. So I think 750 is a good number. Yeah. And I am sorry, the, the term I hate to use the most is the United States of America because, I mean, you would never do that with Europe. You would mm -hmm. never compare Germany to Greece, Denmark to Portugal. Right. How do you compare Anchorage, Alaska to Manhattan or Houston to Wichita, Kansas? Even the Federal Reserve says that this is nine economies yes. flying under one flag. So yep. it's a... It's a gross, it's, 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 you might as well just say earthling. By the way, buy um, the package in Anchorage versus the practice in Manhattan, just so you know. <laughs> um, so a lot of people are saying, well, if you're going to buy a practice for seven fifty, dollars right. how, why don't you finance in um, another thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 and have a consultant in there for 12 to 18 months for this transition? I mean, if you're, if you're going to buy a $750,000 asset, it's kind of like if you were going to buy a, um, a, um, Oh, what's the big uh, uh, car from uh, a Jaguar okay. from Britain? You know, you should pay the extra 30000 and and have a mechanic live in the trunk uh, so that whenever it broke down every five miles, he could right. just pop them out of the trunk. Should, should you buy, I mean, we know you should buy a Jaguar with a full-time mechanic. Should you buy a dental practice and a consultant for a year to hedge your the safety of your investment? If or you, you believe and see that. Or oh, yeah, I see it. Okay. Um, I am a proponent of consultants when the, the buyer needs it, when they need systems in place, when they need understanding of politics of the office, systems of the office, how things work in terms of employees. And, uh, and there's a lot of great consultants out there. Um, a lot of them on Dentaltown uh, I admire tremendously. However, there are more consultants that I have concerns with than ones that I think really provide a return on investment. Um, and some of these consultants are costing forty to fifty thousand dollars, and I, I find it ridiculous. Um, and we're now we're now getting banks to basically force some some banks will force these consultants onto buyers and it's just it, it in my mind it's atrocious but i believe consultants can have huge return on investments for buyers that need them and i think that a consultant in in, in analyzing the practice transition process can be astro i mean amazing when you when they're looking at the practice from an outsider's perspective Here's what I think you can do to this practice based upon who you are, buyer, versus this what this seller is doing. Awesome. Love it. Love those programs. Not all not all uh, consultants will do that, though, but I love that. Um, and, yes, I definitely think consultants are worth it. But do I think everyone needs a consultant? No, I don't. Well, de dentists are smart people. I mean, they... I mean, when you know the difference between a eukaryote, a prokaryote, uh, uh, right. trigonometry and geometry, you can you can figure this stuff out. You can figure it out on Dentaltown. Uh, well, yeah, and and that is so. Oh, Dentaltown, I think, has been one of the greatest things to protecting. So, a lot of people could get away with a lot before Dentaltown, in, in my opinion. Um, there was misinformation everywhere. There was no way of connecting dots. There was no way of being able to monitor and analyze and, and really just figure out who was saying what. And so you had a lot of these, I'll just say bad actors, that were out there that were extremely successful through misinformation and everything else. And Dentaltown has brought that, uh, I mean, I love it because it really creates more of a, a par playing field of, no, these people really helped me. 
And and on Facebook, if you say something that that nefarious person doesn't like, you're, you're just deleted you're gone. from the group. Yeah, but you, you you can't do that on Dental Town. No, you know, Dental Town is a it's a um, place where you might have to hear something you. Can't I have I have people like. who don't like me, and I'm a moderator, and I I can't one I can't delete it, but two. One of the beauties of Dental Town is that it's there's there's no there's suppression from there's definitely suppression if you're going to come on to Dental Town and just try to be a, a troll or something else yes there's suppression but there's not a suppression of ideas and that's that's what I really love about it and if you um, and when everybody agrees with you, you're, you're in, in the a wrong, cemetery. That or yeah. you're in the wrong room. One yeah, of the you're, two. You're, you're dead. You're, yeah. you're, um, so um, here's, okay, so I don't even know why we're discussing this because I don't see a lot of the advice taken, but there's two dental schools right here in okay. our town. Here. There's one in Gilbert. There's one in uh, Mesa. And they come out of school and they got $400,000 of debt. And I say, look, your dad's a dentist. And you got married and had a little grandbaby. Trust me. They want you to live in their house for free. Right. So you can start saving up, paying down. No, 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 no. Not only that. I'm going to go get a Mercedes. They, they go buy a house, and they haven't bought a practice yet. I hate it. And they say, um, oh, that won't matter that I have $400,000 student loans, and I bought a $400,000 student loans when I go to buy a practice because the practice, if it's a great practice, it'll, it'll be its own equity for its right. own loan. So is it okay if I go buy a house before no. I go buy a practice? So I'm going to tell you no. And I'm very, I feel very strongly about that because it is much easier to find a practice and then buy the house than it is to buy the house and then find a practice in the immediate area. Oh yeah. And probably. so, and, and that's the issue because now all of a sudden, great. The house becomes a ball and chain. I only want to look in an area which is, you know, within 20 miles because uh, I don't want to commute. I want to do this or whatever. And now all of a sudden I'm within a very small locality, uh, geographic area, and I have to find a practice that works just right. It's really bad. And, and by the way, just economics 101, you typically want to buy income producing assets first rather than income suppression I know, assets. I know, you go down into the poorest neighborhoods in, in, in town. You go down to Guadalupe, Yep. and you'll see a, a $45,000 lowrider yep. parked in front of a house that doesn't have electricity. Right. And you, and I've, I've had, I, for 32 years, I walked out to the car, because they always want to show me to see the yeah. car. And I always put my arm around him. I said, I know why you got that. Because, you know, when you drive down the street, Maria is just going to jump in the car. Mm -hmm. But I said, if you would have spent that at DeVry, you would have had a job with dental benefits. Right. Go, go. I I understand. I understand how hot Maria is, but you, you got to get dental benefits uh, first. Yeah. And um, so, so, and so then everyone knows that. And then you go into dentistry and they live in a, 4,000 square foot home they own, but they rent a shitty thousand square foot office for 10, 20 years. And now they're, they're I mean, it's like, why, why do you, why is your house consumption three times bigger than your office? Right. Why do you own your consumption and you lease your, your deal? Right. And then, and then I ask you to do certain things. And every time I tell you something to do to your office, you say, my landlord won't let me, my landlord don't let me. Right. That only happened one time to Sam Walton. <laughs> and him and Helen said, He's, we will never yep. lease again. And that happened in good old Bentonville, Arkansas, yep. where everybody went to the same church and he still got screwed over by his landlord. And he said, I'll, I'll, I'll never do it again. Right. Um, so yeah, when you, when you own consumption and you lease your investment, that's uh, uh, crazy. So um, last but not least, well, God, we went way over. Thanks so much for staying over. So um, last question is, um, She's smarter than you. I mean, my God, she's a dentist. Yes. And, uh, and and by the way, you're not only just old, you're old and senile. That's true. And you remind her of her dad. Um, That's a good point. So she she came out of school. She's been working associate two years, and she finally realizes, I want to buy that office. Right. So she's going to call that guy and say, I want to buy it. Is, is that, should she call that guy first? 
or should she call representation? Should she call you first? So I don't mind people talking, but what what bugs me, I guess, is uh, it might be a little strong. What concerns me is when people come to me after the letter of intent has been signed, because now my hands are par- at least partially tied. And then I start asking questions. Where the hell did you get a letter of intent? Well, I, you, I mean, does, you, yeah. was it a boilerplate download? Yeah, or, or, or a boilerplate download, or they got it from the broker, or whatever. Um, I like so, and I I can't speak for everyone, but when people bring me practices, I, I'm not charging them because I want to make sure that they're buying the right practice. If you're an eight hundred thousand dollar producer and you're looking at this practice that's only doing four hundred thousand. I want to tell you, you're making a big mistake. Oh, and you know what the number one thing is? It's, but I don't want to go into a lot of debt. Okay, well, there's, and I hate saying this, but there is good debt and there's bad debt. Good debt is going into debt, basically what we were talking about before, to acquire a practice that has significant cash flow that allow you to satisfy all your debt obligations, pay them down, blah, blah, blah. Bad debt is going on buying that Mercedes Benz because you're a doctor. Not good debt. So, but there's also that, there's a subsequent issue, and that is you have to maximize revenue too. You maximize your income potential. So if you're doing $800,000 as a doctor, the practice minimum that you should be looking at is doing $800,000. But really, you should be looking at practice doing about a million, because again, what are you not getting as an associate? You're not getting the hygiene. And so... That's what you have to start doing. And please understand that going into debt for a practice that has cash flow is is good for you, not bad for you. Buying a practice because it's cheap is a really bad economic decision. What I what I tell my the, the the most successful buyers are ones that find a practice where they do at least 95% of the procedures that have hygiene. I like I mean, at least 25%, but I like it to be more than 30% of uh, revenues where they will also be able to add procedures just based upon who they are. So the, the existing doctor is referring out endo and oral surgery because they just don't like to do it. I, the buyer, I like doing endo and I like doing oral surgery and I want to be adding Invisalign or maybe implants in the future. That's the practice that you buy because you will be insanely successful. So Warren Buffett's always said the industry never, he'll never go into an industry if under two conditions, if someone else sets the fee or if it's capital intensive. So we already chose an industry where someone Someone else is setting the the fee fee. and it's very capital intensive. So we're already in the space Warren told me in business class, 1980, you don't go in there. And I didn't listen to him. Then I, I should have dropped out of Creighton, taken my tuition money, bought Berkshire Hathaway And then just went and hung out and ate tacos on the beach for 30 years. And I'd be worth a gazillion dollars. I've done the math on it one time. I mean, if I, the day I listened to him, um, I just, that one semester of uh, Creighton. How much? uh, uh, It it was, it was tens of millions of dollars. Um, But anyway, so, um, so that is why when you go around the earth, um, the two procedures where government insurance doesn't set the fee is clear uh, aligners and implants They've taken over. Like you go to Tokyo, Paris, and London, three of the greatest cities in the world. Their socialized medicine only gives you one hundred dollars US for a molar root canal. So no one does a molar root canal. Right. They just pull out the tooth and place a fifteen hundred dollar Stroman implant yeah. or Noble BioCare. And and that's why I fear socialized medicine because the only thing I understand, which is this wide. Under every socialized me- is a disaster. Right. So what are they doing in cardiology and cancer that I'm not even smart enough to know? And and um and second of all, you already decided you you whine that you're three hundred thousand two hundred eighty four thousand dollars student loans. Okay, I want to remind you that there's only twenty countries where you can borrow two hundred eighty thousand dollars being a kid from other people. Most countries you have no access to other people's money. But the catch is with other people's money. Once you go down the road where you've borrowed two, three, four hundred thousand dollars of other people's money, you're gonna have to keep borrowing all the way to one million because once you get that much in debt, you can't pay it back working right. at Taco Bell. Right. So one once you I think once you've passed a quarter million dollars, 
you're going to have to go all the way to a million now. I mean, yeah. there's just a point of no return. And, and, and then I'll tell you another thing is one of the greatest joys of being a dentist is, um, you know, it, it's politically incorrect um, to, and taboo uh, to love totalitarian dictators. Uh, but, man, when you own your own business, there's no, there's no judge, there's no jury, there's no Congress. Right. I think one of the greatest benefits of, of owning a dental office is if, if you can't stand your hygienist, you can fire her. Right. If you don't like that patient, you can tell them to go to hell. Um, I put a door on each side of my wall because I knew my favorite one-liner said, you know, this building's got four doors. Just pick one and let it hit the back of your ass on the way out. And I've only said it probably maybe, I don't know, maybe once every six months for 32 <laughs> years. Um, but um, so, and, and then I know your number one stress is going to be when you get married to another dentist with no sex, no kids, no glue, and one doesn't like the other one's composites and the right. other one wants to go into sleep medicine or buy a laser or CAD cam. Or, yep. I mean, I see it where the one dentist spends $150,000 on CAD cam and then the other partner is sending to a lab and he can get an explorer under every margin of every mm -hmm. CAD cam. You know, it's just so messy. Yes. So stay in your lane. Work for yourself. And um, when you have your eye on a practice and you need a broker, this is the man. He's done 7,000 of these I things. I don't broker, though. I don't broker. So, no, just, just the legal. But, I mean, so, yes, we're attorneys, but because we do this all the time, I mean, we really take a global approach. I mean, I, I want to know overhead. And my, now I'm an attorney. You said stay in your lane. Absolutely. But I want to know because it benefits my client. I should, if I'm catering to dentists, I should know as much of their practices as they do. So I, we talk about overhead. We talk about all of these aspects, you know, procedures, uh, insurances, all of that stuff, because hopefully I'm providing more to my client as a result. And, and as a result, they're going to be better off. So I, I, you know, it would so, be much so, easier if so I was just you, an attorney. So, what you do, so if I'm buying this guy's practice yeah. through a broker, then I'm coming in. I'm I'm sending you to do the the uh, legal from thirty thousand feet, but not with the actual transaction of the buy sell agreement. No, I'm doing buy sell. I'm doing all of it. So, the, but so I then where come are in. you not a broker? Why why is he? Because I'm not. I'm not. I'm not representing. I'm not taking a commission i'm not the seller hasn't come to me saying sell my practice for me That's the sellers the come to me saying can you can you help me with all the legal aspects or hey i'm thinking about selling what do i need to do um or i mean we basically take a a, a doctor from the time they're in dental school to when they've retired like that's what we try to do we try to we try to carry them through their career and if they got a question what, what's the best way to contact you um either through dental town jason patrick wood is the the moniker or whatever it's called um emails jason at dentalattorneys.com you can also call at 800-499-1474 do also want to point out there's so much misinformation about we've talked a lot about debt um but there's, understand, as a young doctor, there are banks that are tripping over themselves to give you money to acquire a practice. Uh, and they don't care that you have three to $400,000 in debt. They, what they care is, can you produce? And does this practice have enough revenue to adequately support that type of debt? So that's what you need. Please, please, please know that banks will give you money. Um, yeah, in America, getting uh, a loan is not the hard part. No. It's paying it back. It's <laughs> a bitch. Right. Uh, they'll, they'll loan it. I mean, I, I watched it when I had four kids. They were yeah. sending them credit card applications while they were uh, under 10. Also, um, a lot of the young kids, um, why are, is it say, why are you an Esquire, E-S-Q, instead of a J-D after your name? Um. It's really preference. I could put, well, actually, a JD is someone who graduated from law school. An Esquire is someone who's passed the bar. So an actual attorney. 
just because I go to law school doesn't mean that I'm an attorney. I have a Juris Doctorate, but I'm not an attorney unless I pass an exam, an, an additional exam. So is, is, it seems like more people are doing ESQ these days instead of JD. Yeah, I, I, I do whatever's custom. I don't care. And it's bizarre because when you're um, on the internet, I mean, there's right. um, I mean, Australia, London barristers and solicitors, solicitors, yep. and all that kind of stuff. But it's just, just the the legal world. Uh, I prefer Jason, Doctor Esquire, actually. Doctor Esquire. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I actually prefer escorts, but that's a whole nother whole nother <laughs> subject. Um, so, um, but seriously, thank you so much uh, for all. You're that welcome. You've done for I, I've had a great time. You're uh, you're just the legend, the man. Thank oh, you whatever. So much for thank you. On. I appreciate it, man. All right. Thank you.